goats are conquering empty streets in a British village. What a strange picture to us humans who are used to only seeing ourselves governing the world. But as soon as we withdraw, nature quickly takes over. Like these monkeys in Thailand as well. Could the corona crisis eventually be good for the environment? Satellite images seem to prove just that. In Italy, where people have been living in lockdown for weeks, traffic has nearly stopped and nitrogen dioxide levels have clearly dropped. And another study suggests that Germany might even reach its climate goals as the corona lockdown causes the economy to produce much less CO2. Well, factories devoid of workers, thousands of flights cancelled, empty streets because people are working from home instead of driving to the office. Global economic activity has been put into an induced coma. Bad for the world economy, but from a climate perspective, the coronavirus pandemic is not entirely negative. Environmental activists might actually rejoice. Measures have been implemented immediately that drastically cut emission, emissions, measures that otherwise would have taken years to come into effect. Images from space. China's air pollution, shown in red, shrunk dramatically between December and March. Thick smog has given way to blue skies. Thanks to closed factories, reduced capacity power plants and fewer cars on the roads, Beijing's residents have been enjoying some unusually fresh spring air. And they're not alone. The air in Europe is better too. Depending on how long the crisis goes on for, the Agora think tank estimates that Germany's greenhouse gas emissions could be 40% lower this year than last. Tourist hotspots are also enjoying some respite. Venice, normally bustling with over 20 million tourists each year, is virtually empty. The water in its many canals, usually dull and murky as a result of the many boats, is suddenly clear. Aircraft are responsible for around 7% of global greenhouse gas emissions. But the booming business is currently very unbooming. International flights have been reduced to a minimum. German carrier Lufthansa, for example, has cut 90% of its long-distance flights. In many countries, lockdowns are set to continue for some time. Others are on the threshold of theirs. China, however, is beginning to wind its economy back up again. And that raises the question, when the lockdowns end, will it be business as usual? Well, will it? Joining me now is Ajit Niranjan. He's from our uh, environment desk. Uh, Ajit, we just saw some of the positive effects in inverted commas, of this pandemic on the environment. So will we or should we go back to business as usual? We need to go back to what we were doing before, but in a different way. It's really difficult to talk about silver linings or to kind of celebrate these lockdowns because, of course, we're in the middle of a pandemic and this is a much more urgent crisis than the climate crisis that we're also living under. You can understand people celebrating this partially, particularly when we talk about air pollution. Now, air pollution is one of the world's most deadly killers. It claims more than 7 million lives each year, and it shaves off on average about three years of our lives, mm. particularly for people living in the global south, in Africa and Asia. Now, what this means when we've got lockdowns which have reduced pollution, as we can see partially in China and Italy, is that in the short term, at least people are able to breathe better. The question is, how long can this be held on for? And once these lockdowns lift, mm. how will the economy be reshaped in a way that doesn't lead to just more smoke, more smog being produced? Yeah, rather puts things into perspective. Ajit, the shutdown also causes a drastic cut in CO2 emissions to a degree that Germany might even reach its climate goals for this year prematurely. Is that shutdown or a shutdown of that magnitude what it takes to reach climate targets? It's one way of reaching them, but I think most climate experts would say it's not a particularly good way of doing so. There are clear solutions that would enable us to reduce our greenhouse gas, gas emissions and meet the climate targets that countries have agreed on in a way that doesn't require people to stay locked in their houses or to halt economic activity. The most obvious of these solutions is to transition from fossil fuels to renewable energy sources like wind and solar power. 
and on top of that to change how we uh, consume food how we to reduce the amount of for instance beef that's being eaten that requires raising rainforests and raising large numbers of cattle that belch methane and other greenhouse gases um, so the key point is really to from what the climate experts are saying is to find ways to reduce these emissions without causing the harm to to the economy to humans that these lockdowns are currently doing. But Ajit, do you think that uh, once the recovery period after COVID has started, do you think that fighting climate change will go on the back burner for a while? I think we're already seeing that happen, and it's hard to predict how that will play out once the pandemic is over, which will hopefully be as soon as possible. What we're going to see this year for sure is climate summits being cancelled or postponed or, I mean, potentially held over Skype and video chats, but a lot less effective is a clear answer. We can see governments have much bigger priorities to deal with, namely mm. reducing the spread of the virus. And on top of that, we also have the issue of um, the kind of momentum behind change being lost. So even climate activists, these school strikers protesting like Greta Thunberg, having to do that over Skype, it's a lot less in the public domain. It's a lot less on people's minds because rightly there are other more pressing issues to deal with. Now, the uh, coronavirus outbreak is actually changing uh, the way we think uh, about a whole range of things, including how we treat nature. Intensive farming has come in for particular criticism. Many of many uh, new viruses have spread from animals to humans. Some say that in, uh, grow, that in growing vast quantities of a single crop in monocultures or stripping the rainforest off its wood, humanity is laying the groundwork for outbreaks like this one. Is that true, Ajit? Are people just using the current crisis to further their agendas, or is there indeed a direct connection between, say, the rainforest and the coronavirus? There's a direct co uh, connection between human activity encroaching on ecosystems and the effect on pandemics. Whether that was the case with this particular coronavirus is too early to tell. There's some suggestions that um, the virus spread initially from bats, through pangolins, and then to humans. We know that the center of the outbreak in Wuhan, China, was in a wet market, where you've got lots of animals being traded, sold illegally for meat um, on top of each other. It's very easy to spread from animal to animal. Now, that can all accelerate. And what we're seeing clearly from calls from ecologists, calls from scientists, to protect these rainforests, to protect nature. And even if we can't necessarily link it to the current crisis, to be aware that this will help prevent future pandemics. Ajit Niranjan from our Environment Desk, thank you very much. OK, time now for your questions, answered by our science correspondent, Derek Williams, locked away in his office at home. Today, we start with the weather. Does hot weather help stop or slow the virus? Many infectious endemic diseases respond to weather conditions or have seasons, uh, like flu, which is most prevalent in the northern hemisphere in the wintertime. That's not just because it might remain intact outside the body for longer in the cold or the damp, but also because wintertime is when people tend to group together in enclosed spaces. Most of the most severe coronavirus outbreaks so far have been in places that were still in the midst of winter, but where spring is now on the way. We don't really know yet whether when things heat up in the northern hemisphere, it'll slow the spread of COVID-19, but there is reason for cautious hope that it might. Um, related coronaviruses have been shown to have seasonality, but the WHO has warned that at this point, we very much just have to wait and see. What's the lifespan of the coronavirus? A study released a few weeks ago in the New England Journal of Medicine looked at exactly that question and came up with some ballpark figures. It first looked at how long the coronavirus remained in the air and found there were still viable levels of it after three hours. The researchers also looked at materials like stainless steel and plastic and found that the virus survives on those surfaces for up to three days. On cardboard, it only remained viable for around 24 hours. 
uh, it's important to say that those tests they took place under strict laboratory conditions. So you can't really transfer those results one to one in the real world. In all likelihood, those are probably pretty conservative estimates and the virus won't survive that long in real world conditions on those surfaces. But they do provide a kind of a rule of thumb. Can the virus spread when money changes hands? Paper banknotes and bills are not all that different than surfaces like cardboard. So yes, you can expect the virus to survive for a while on their surfaces. Um, other studies have shown that money does regularly collect and spread other microorganisms. In China, at one point early in the outbreak, officials were even disinfecting banknotes in an effort to control the spread of COVID-19. So, in theory, yes, money is a possible vector for infection, but, but don't forget that you can't catch the disease through your skin. The virus has to get into your respiratory tract, and it does that via your hands when you touch your face. So if you avoid doing that and wash your hands thoroughly after conducting any monetary transactions, it should be an effective way to limit uh, any risk. Now, before we go, let's spare a thought for our animal friends in zoos around the world. This lynx seems happy to see some humans again. Just like this ostrich, cheerfully welcoming the camera crew here at the zoo. The ones who feel it the most are the highly intelligent creatures like apes and parrots. The sudden lack of stimulation is a problem for them. For us, it would be a bit like having our TVs removed from our homes. After all, visitors are a key source of their entertainment. Animals throughout the zoo seem to be looking out for any human contact. Others are becoming more intimate with their fellow beasts. Birds, in particular, are focusing more than usual on their mates. Before, they were often distracted by visitors. Keepers say that once the corona crisis is over, they expect to see a little baby boom. <laughs>